part of the university school of education and we are one of the largest specializations in the school with 70 students in steady state pursuing masters and doctoral degrees in all areas of Jewish education. We have seven tenured faculty members and 10 adjunct faculty members teaching and conducting research and development in diverse areas within the field of Jewish education such as visions for Jewish education, issues of Jewish identity in the modern world, Jewish communities around the world, teaching Jewish texts, entrepreneurship in Jewish education, and others. And I pride myself on having the privilege of being the director of the Center, and as such as I present myself to you this morning. After we pride ourselves on maintaining contact with all those who lead and conduct Jewish education all over the world, both on the communal and institutional level. We feel we must hear firsthand about Jewish communal affairs and Jewish education from those most directly involved. Only then can we be confident that our research and teaching is grounded in reality. Many of our graduates go on to assume leadership positions in Jewish education, in Israel and in Israel. It is for this reason that we are so interested in models of leadership in the Jewish world. It is for this reason also that we are so grateful to you, Samir Davis, for coming to Israel and the university to share your perspective on Jewish leadership with us. For the orientation of our listeners, whom we thank for coming in the middle of a regular teaching day to join us. Sir Mick Davis is Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Jewish Leadership Council of the United Kingdom, the umbrella body of the largest Jewish charities and institutions in the UK, responsible for strategic imperatives of British Jewry. He is also Chairman of the Prime Minister's Holocaust Memorial Commission in the UK, and former Chair of the UJIA and currently is Joint President. He is a graduate of the Theodore Herbst School in Port Elizabeth, South Africa, and holds an honors degree in commerce from Rhodes University in South Africa, and was recently knighted by the Queen of England. Without further ado, I call on Sir Mick Davis to address us on the subject of changing the rules, principles of the Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, uh, that lovely introduction. Um, and uh, I hope that I answered live up to the billing. Um, can I just say during the course of the, the next period, we, if you feel free to interrupt and ask questions, um, and as long as they're not too abusive, I'll try and respond constructively. Um, I, I guess that um, I, I should start off by saying that, um, um, so to continue the introduction as it were, that um, communal leadership is not my day job, um, although you're going to see that there is uh, a, a significant degree of, of time spent on it. Um, I sort of read, during the, the major part of my period that, I was, that I've been in leadership, I was running a very large company. I built it up from uh, a small mining company of a market value of $500 million to something like $60 billion when it eventually was sold in 2012. Uh, we operated in 22 countries around the world, 130 operations, 90,000 people. Now, I don't say this to you 
uh, in, in any sense of, uh, of, of wanting to demonstrate the fact that I'm a terribly successful businessman. In fact, uh, in, in the unceremonious way that I was boosted out in 2012, uh, you can tell that my success had its limitations. But I make the point that um, I had to think about running organizations, and the way that I thought about running Extrada um, was not possible, in fact, to translate into the way that you try and lead, uh, try and lead uh, communities. But there were very important principles which under, underpinned the proposition of running um, Extrada, and that was propositions of value. I mean, first of all, we, still, we believe that we are a vital company, and this word vital I'm going to use again uh, during the course of uh, this afternoon. I mean, vital has connotations of importance, of criticality, but vital also has the connotations of vitality, of youthfulness, of a lot of dynamism, dynamism uh, the capacity to, re to reinvent and renew. And the way that we thought about our company was as a vital company producing products which were vital for humanity, that uh, even today, if one thinks about the, the current concerns that people have over coal, we're a big coal producer, Believe me, none of, none of the world could have progressed into the Industrial Revolution without the cheap uh, availability of coal. Nickel is critical to your stainless steel your, as, you, uh, as you eat uh, your meals during the day. You wouldn't have toothpaste, you wouldn't have toothbrushes, you wouldn't have motor cars unless the stuff was dug out of the ground at some point in time. So quite clearly, what we do, what we did was absolutely vital. But in terms of the way we thought about ourselves as a company, it's critical as well. That unless you believe that we maintain a constant ability to renew our business proposition, we would meander and die as many other companies would instead of growing. And it's behind that, 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 that concept of vitality, that, that principle of vitality, there's some very core propositions in terms of, of values. Um, that the first value was the pursuit of value that the, the, the company believed, and the people in the company believed, their prime obligation was to pursue value, was the creation of value. Value for all stakeholders, not just value for shareholders. The, the other propositions in a particular sense of order was that we, we sort of did what we said we would do, that we could be relied upon, so that we said X, was, X, Y, Z would happen, X, Y, Z was produced. And that gave people a sense of confidence in, the, in, in their investment in us and in our proposition going forward. It gave communities a sense of confidence in the impact that we would have on them. Because you must understand there's something unique about mining companies. That we invade communities in a way that no other business does. We take stuff out of the ground, we impact the environment, we potentially close them down when the mine finishes, and we build them up when the mine starts. So it is a very, very uh, direct and, and, and unique uh, relationship that one has with communities, almost an intimate relationship. And therefore, practicing this value of doing what you say you would do is absolutely fundamental. Um, the idea of, um, um, of daring to be different, in other words, to be, of, of, of taking risk, was critical to our company, critical to the people who ran, who, who ran their different businesses in the company. That they knew that there was a license to take risk, and they would be protected if they did not take that risk. Um, so this whole concept of taking risk and pursuing value, and, and you'll see the word momentum on the board there, momentum is very important. Unless you're constantly going forward, you can't reach your destination. So those organizations, those companies, which spend a huge amount of time in analysis and the paralysis of analysis, ultimately make bad decisions when they ultimately move. And those who are constantly in a state of momentum will make mistakes, but those mistakes, in fact, generally speaking, are not catastrophic from the, the survivability of the company's perspective. I think that the, 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 the important core value which I want to end on there is the question of the value of care. We cared about the people who worked for us, we cared about the communities that we operated in, we cared about society, we cared about the environment. Now sometimes we weren't that smart in how we demonstrated that care, but it was a fundamental proposition of care. Because if you're not empathetic, if you do not relate, to the environments that you operate in, the communities you operate in, you can never be successful. Now, I, I put those values to you because those are sort of implicit values which I've tried to use in common leadership in the United Kingdom. Um, and in terms of translating, the, translating those values into what arrangements, what are the best arrangements for those values to permeate through the organization, the fundamental principle of this organization was one of decentralization. So we basically decentralized authority. I had something like 
25 people at the head office when I took over the company and had two operations operating in two countries and 23,000 people. By the time we finished in 22 countries with 90,000 people, we had 40 people at the head office. There wasn't one person in the head office who was remotely capable of running a mine. I deliberately made that decision. There couldn't be anybody in the head office who had that capability. If they had that capability, they had to be at the operations. I didn't want anybody at the head office second guessing the decision making of people at the operations. And I took the view that the people who were closest to the, to the information would make the best decisions. So behind the principle of decentralization is clearly a great devolvement of authority. Now mostly when people talk about decentralization, they talk about the decentralization of accountability. So everybody gets held accountable, but nobody has decision rights. So we, does, we, we, made, we were very careful about devolving authority. But in devolving authority, we very much respected the organogram. In the sense that I would never give an ins direct instruction to somebody to directly report to me. But at the same time, we encourage the dissemination of information. That I could speak to anybody in the organization. I could find up anybody and say, what's going on? If I wanted to give instruction, I spoke to the head of those operations who was my direct report. But I was entitled to know what's going on. Everybody was entitled to know what's going on. Because in the sharing of information, allowed a sharing of ideas and ultimately a sharing of views as to how we should go forward. So this concept of, of sharing information was absolutely fundamental to the concept um, of, of, of decentralization. So that was a very important aspect in, in, in the whole question of, uh, of, of, of what underpinned my sort of philosophy in how we ran companies. Now, um, so to continue with this, the whole concept of, 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 of the of the running of, of, of organization. I mean, the question, the question arises is, you know, how, much, how, much do you, how much do you actually translate that into um, a community? And what do you find in the community? And you're going to find in this community that it's a very antithesis of decentralization. It's a very antithesis of centralization. In other words, it's a state of anarchy. It's a community which has developed over time without any planning. Um, I'm going to reflect to you that it almost thinks of itself as a country. Um, we only sort of 270, 300,000 people in the United Kingdom, but every Jew thinks actually that they, this, we, we, we're part of the country and we have decision rights and access rights in the same way as the Prime Minister of England actually has. Um, you cannot, in fact, translate your business principles into, um, in, in, into a community like this. And the only way that you can affect massive change is if there's an incredible if there's an exogenous event of great significance which causes the destabilization of the um, of the equilibriums that exist within that community because other because the vested interests that develop as a community grows over hundreds of years the vested interests that develop are incredibly powerful and impossible to break down so unless you have an exogenous event of, of, of significant magnitude to affect dramatic change is very, very difficult. So my, my role is, wasn't one of radicalism, it was one of incrementalism. I incrementally tried to make change. And in the end of the day, I think I affected a great deal of change. And I'll show you the areas where I, I concentrated my efforts and the areas where I am going to try and concentrate my efforts going forward. So having said to you that a great virtue of running decentralized organizations, a great virtue of value propositions, and things like that, I had to modify constantly my behavior in running the community itself. So this is a very structured community. It has a hell of a lot of organizations. The two central institutions of the Board of Deputies, which essentially is, uh, is a mandate from individuals, the highly representative body. Uh, it deals with the sort of immediate day-to-day -day issues that the Jew in the pew would like, to, would like handled. Uh, and it's driven by sort of elected deputies who see themselves almost as members of the parliament. And the Jewish Leadership Council, which at times is a rival organization, at times not, and bearing in mind that the Board of Deputies is a member of the Jewish Leadership Council, but it sort of facilitates the collective action of, of the major agencies. It's a big picture, it's long-term strategic issues which, which, uh, which are on its agenda, it's the umbrella body, and it's led by institutional concerns rather than by um, the representation of uh, deputies who represent uh, individuals or constituencies. Behind this lies an incredible plethora of organizations. Now, 
I'm not even going to give you all of them. I'm going to give you some of them. But I'm detailed enough to give you an idea of how organized, in inverted commas, the UK Jewish community is. And these organizations have developed over, some, over hundreds of years, some over 10 years, 20 years, or whatever. We start off with sort of government, politics, security, advocacy. We have a whole range of organizations there. The Jewish Leadership Council, and I, to, to try and to try and bring some sort of element of order into this number of organizations, I established the political oversight group, which attempts uh, to, uh, to coalesce views and make sure that not too many organizations are doing the same thing. It, it has uh, some success, but not great success. Um, the, uh, the, the, the other organization, which I think is important to, to, to recognize in this thing, is BICOM, which is not a directly a lobbying organization, but it's an organization which attempts to represent the case of Israel uh, amongst media and, and, and strays into uh, political life as well. Uh, and it plays a, a significant role in that. But there are a bunch of other organizations there as well. Then we add on to Israel organization. So you have the United Jewish Israeli Appeal, which is probably the biggest organization. And then you have the friends of every single university, every single hospital, every single cultural organization in, in Israel. So you have friends of Baralan, friends of Hebrew University, friends of Haifa, you know, friends of Ben Gurion, um, you've got friends of this hospital and that hospital. You've got friends of every organization, they're all they're there with organizations. You have, um, you have um, Jaffe's represented there, you have Kiran Asot, which is represented there, uh, Kiran Kayemet, which is represented there, you have the JNF, you have Magin David Adom, you've got Witsa, you've got the Zionist Federation, you've got even political parties are represented there. So you have Labour, you have Likud, all represented in the United Kingdom. Quite extraordinary. I'll then on, add on to that um, the question of social welfare. We have in the two premier organizations, probably is, uh, is Jewish Care and, and Norwood. Jewish Care is an organization which covers the welfare of the aged, Norwood, uh, people of special needs, but there are a gazillion organizations right across um, the UK dealing with uh, social welfare. Add to the mix, interfaith. So we live in a multi-faith country. Jews, for, for different reasons, have been very concerned about their level of acceptance within the United Kingdom. You know, it's a country where uh, Edward I kicked them out, um, um, you know, sort of uh, 900 years ago. Uh, they came back with, under the aegis of Cromwell 300 plus years ago. They still today have not worked out whether they, in fact, they have their place in the sun in the United Kingdom or their place in the rain. So interfaith is a big thing, making sure that they remain connected with the other elements of faith within the community. And there are many interfaith organizations there too. Um, then we add on education organizations. So we have schools. We have uh, uh, an amazing growth of Jewish schools within the United Kingdom over the last decade. Uh, we have the partnership of Jewish schools called Pages. We have the Leobeck College, which is the rabbinical training uh, center for uh, the non-Orthodox movement. We have the London School of Jewish Studies, which is for the Orthodox movement. We have informal, uh, informal education, the JW3, which is sort of like um, uh, the equivalent organizations uh, in, in, the United, in the United States. We have Limud, which is one of Britain's great exports. We have the, we have the Union of Jewish Students, we have UJA do informal education, we have youth movements, it carries on. And then to that, I'm going to add all sorts of other things um, to that. I'm going to add Jewish media. We have Jewish newspapers, five or six Jewish newspapers, we have a Jewish radio, we have arts and, arts and culture organizations, we have Jewish Book Week, we have Jewish Film Festival, the Jewish Music Institute, and we have a Jewish Museum, we have the Maccabi organization looking after sport, uh, we have people involved in, in uh, world issues like B'nai B'rith, uh, Tzedek, we have people involved in Tikkun Olam, uh, a very important part of it, we have people involved in strategic planning like the Jewish Leadership Council. And, uh, and the Board of Deputies. So this, you can see, is a community which is over-organized in one sense, uh, over-represented in many senses, and covers every gamut of life that you can think about. Um, and you would say, well, based on that, um, it all looks tremendous. Um, let's see where we go to. So the, the shape of the community in terms of, of demographics, there's around about 270,000 to 310,000 Jews in the United Kingdom. It's based on the 2011 census, 
extrapolated for um, Israeli and Haredi communities who don't always fill in the forms. Um, and if they do fill in the forms, they omit to indicate whether they're Jewish or not, and you don't have to. So 97% of those are in England, but you know, Britain, Great Britain is made up of England, Scotland, Wales, and, and, and Northern Ireland. But we do have small but active communities there. 75% of this community is nevertheless based around London. So you've got, of, of that, 270,000, a major portion of it sits in the city of London. Um, it's an aging community, but apparently demographically more stable in 2011 than 2001. That is the data of the age profile, age demographics of the Jewish community in that period. Now you would see that it actually looks quite nice because you've got the sort of the, the usual shape of a triangle, triangle, slight bulges in the middle, but nevertheless you see um, a lot of people sitting on the younger end of it and a narrowing at, at the top end of it. And if you compare that to 2011, which is the blue, so you've got the red is the uh, it outlines the 2011 census, the 2001 census shows a community of a different nature. And that's why I say it's apparently more demographically stable today than it was in 2011. But that's an illusion. Because all that growth, all the growth of youth, actually was in the Haredi community. So if you look at the non Haredi community, the mainstream community, which is you know, Central Orthodox, uh, you know, non-orthodox, secular, cultural, this is what you see, a demographically unstable community. The age-old dependency on a, on a crude formula of, of looking at the number of people over 65 uh, divided by the number of people in the economically active age group of 20 to 64 suggests, in fact, that the mainstream community's index is 40%. Now, that's a high index if you compare that to around 28% in uh, the United Kingdom, 29% in OECD generally. And the Haredi community incident is 19%, which is higher than I would have expected it to be because it's almost, that's pretty similar to, to Israel, in fact. Now, it's a crude measure because many people over the age of 65, in fact, are still working. But nevertheless, notwithstanding the, 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 the broad bash nature of the measure, it reflects to you an old age dependency rate, which in fact is, is, is not an attractive position to be in for any, for any community. And, and the Jewish community sits at the right at the wrong end of that spectrum. So that's an issue which struck me when I came into leadership uh, in the Jewish Leadership Council in 2006 in the UJ before that, because that gave me a source of concern. And it immediately suggested to me in 2006 that we had to run a strategic exercise on a capacity to deliver welfare in the United Kingdom over the next 20 to 30 years. Right, so it took me nine years to get the welfare organizations to agree to have that strategic exercise done. They've only now agreed. So that's why I'm going to tell you about incrementalism versus radicalism. So this great organized community is organized in silos. It's not organized as a coherent whole. And that's a really important thing to understand. A little bit more about the community in terms of affiliation. About 60% are religiously affiliated. Now, this is a loose term, but let's leave it at that. Almost 60% would do a Shabbat dinner on Friday night uh, with their family. Yeah, 76% of the inmarrieds, and in fact, 18, almost 20% of the intermarrieds would do that. About 20% are Shomer Mitzvot. Um, about 18% are from the non belong to the non-Orthodox uh, communities. And 26% of these people, and in, generally with Jews, would, would class themselves as traditional. Now some of them are traditional religious, some are traditional not religious, but class themselves as a traditional. 24% think of themselves as cultural Jews, secular Jews. Now there's no, no connectivity with religious roots, but never they see themselves from a secular cultural point of view as Jewish. 26% in the UK have non-Jewish spouses, although I have to say the rate of intermarriage is declining in the United Kingdom. And at the moment, around about 14% are Haredi using a narrow definition of Haredi in terms of trying to identify where people live. Because a Haredi community live in very particular uh, parts of the, the, the geographical locations. Yes, sir? Have you got a breakdown of the non-Jewish gender spouse? In other words, Jewish women as opposed to Jewish men marrying up. Do you have that? Yes, I do. I don't have it with me, but we do. If you let me have your card, I can, get, I can send you that information. 
In terms of the shape of the community going forward, Jewish schooling, now, as I said to you, there's been a massive growth in, in kids due in, in, in entering school. When we first got to the United Kingdom, there were far fewer schools, and I would say that there were less than 50% of all age groups going to Jewish schools. There were more going to Jewish primary schools, less going to Jewish high schools. So there's probably around about 60% going to Jewish primary schools and about 35% going to Jewish high schools. Today, almost, if you include the Haredi community, 80% of Jewish kids go to Jewish schools. I hesitate to call the Haredi schools schools um, because generally in many of the Haredi schools they don't speak, they don't teach them in English. Their, 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 their numeracy skills are, are somewhat limited. Um, they certainly don't get to deal with the national curriculum. So there is an issue there which I'll come back to just now. But excluding the Haredi community, we go around about 70% of Jewish kids go to schools versus 50% of the people in the, who are in their 20s today went to Jewish schools. 30% of the people in their 40s today went to Jewish schools. So it shows you a very rapid increase in the rate of kids going to Jewish schools. And in fact, it's very interesting. When, again, when Barbara and I arrived in, in, in the UK some 17, 18 years ago, there was a commonly held belief that Jewish schooling was not an appropriate way to equip your, your child for, um, uh, for being effective in, in a normal secular society. In other words, and, and, and we heard the term, you have to learn to mix. Well, clearly learning to mix is no longer a feature of the decision making that Jewish parents make today or think about Jewish schooling uh, uh, today. So 90% believe that Jewish schooling adds to Jewish identity. In terms of an interesting survey that was done, and I, I don't play great story about this because you never quite know how to analyze the data, it was a 2014 study by Jewish policy research that people thought about identity in some very interesting ways. For, for many people, remembering the Holocaust is an act of Jewish identification. Um, um, just belonging to the community, being part of the community, doing things in the community is an act of Jewish, of Jewish identification. Being associated with Israel, being, if thinking about Israel in a sense of Zionist, is, is part of being Jewish. The belief in God, only 50 odd percent of them think that you need to believe in God to be Jewish. Keeping kosher, 50 percent, which is actually quite a high rate. Um, socializing in Jewish circles, 47 percent. So belonging and socialization are two different things. Um, so people want to know that they are seen to belong. In other words, they want to be a member of a Jewish organization. They don't necessarily want to have their best friends as Jews. Now, older people had slightly different concerns than younger people, but it doesn't change the shape of what people considered to be Jewish identity. When it comes to Israel, and this is interesting, 87% <coughs> agree that Jews are responsible for ensuring the survival of Israel. So 87% of Jews in this national community think that they have a role to play in the survival of Israel. 78% of them support the two-state solution. So it sort of gives you an idea where they, where they sit politically. 72% support the security effects and saw Operation Cast Lead as an act of self-defense. 87% see Iran as an existential threat to Israel. So you've got a community which is highly concerned about security, but at the same time actually has a, um, a sort of a center or center-left view of, uh, of where the political uh, direction of Israel should go. About 67% think that Israeli politics is dysfunctional, perhaps not <laughs> due to some of the percentage in this country. 56% think that non-Jewish minorities are discriminated against. 74% oppose settlement expansion. So it's giving you a real sense of where people, when they ask these questions, think about um, sort of political positioning within, uh, within Israeli politics. But they are committed, they are concerned, and generally they are conciliatory. So in other words, these people, these 74% who oppose second ex ex expansion, would have a highly conciliatory view of, uh, of, of politicians who come in uh, and, and, and propagate second, second expansion. So they are not confrontational at all in, that they were, in the way that they express um, their views on Israel. Now, I speak for the majority. There's a very vocal minority, right? The minority on the right who take out the oxygen, and there's a very vocal minority on the left who attempt to take out oxygen. But generally speaking, for the majority. So that gives you a sense of what the community is. Let's think about the community in terms of uh, the paradox. So 20 years ago, when I saw almost the time when I arrived, they fretted about viability. And the question that was asked, will we have Jewish grandchildren? So they had this deep existential concern that generation to generation would see a fritting away through assimilation 
of the Jewish community and can the critical mass of this community participate and that would fragment. Ten years ago, they no longer fretted about will we are Jewish. They no longer fretted about viability. They didn't fret about the critical mass. They fretted about capacity. Do we have the capacity to deal with the critical issues that face us? Do we have the funding capability, etc.? And today, they fret about the environment. They fret about will we be safe? And that's a very recent fear in the United Kingdom. And it, and it really reached its zenith, I guess, in, the, uh, in, in last year's Gaza, uh, Gaza campaign, where they, it, it coincided with a rising tide of anti-Semitic incidents across Europe, uh, very obnoxious material being, being, uh, being floated in demonstrations in London, and people having a real sense, do they have a future? Do their children have a future? Do they have a safe future living in the United Kingdom? So it's a community which faces the same demographic challenges the whole of Europe faces, the Aspen community faces. At the same time, and by any index, it seems to be thriving and it seems to be doing well in terms of its organisations. So in all of this, however, there, there, there rests a, a great many challenges. The, Haredi, the expansion of the Haredi birth rate, which I'll come back later, is for me a very, very significant concern, and hence it's in red. Um, and that links with the growing sense of potential deprivation and poverty that this community is going to find itself in and the drain of resources that will have on the mainstream community. The possibility in the future, given the demographics that I showed you, so leaving aside the mainstream community, that we build secondary schools which in a few years' time we're going to have too much capacity. If you have too much, and bearing in mind, you must, one thing is important. Uh, I always say to Jews in the United Kingdom, you know, they don't realize how blessed they are. The United Kingdom, I think, is the only diaspora Jewish community where the state funds Jewish schools, in other words, faith-based schooling. So there are one or two private Jewish schools, but the vast majority of Jewish schools are funded by the state. So the state pays for it. The non-Jewish taxpayer funds for Jews to go to Jewish schools. But if you have spare capacity in your Jewish school, you don't have to bring in non-Jews. And if your capacity drops down to a certain level, and you have more non-Jews than Jews, and you no longer have a Jewish school. So there is a there is an area of concern there going forward. Um, I'm very concerned about declining rates of philanthropy, and this is across the diaspora world. You know, in the old days, wealthy Jews had no choice but to give their money to Jewish causes. Um, one, they had a concern, and two, other people didn't want their money. But when in the United States in the 1950s and 1960s they worked out that it was okay to have a Jewish name in a building, they suddenly changed the face of Jewish giving. And over time, philanthropy has shifted dramatically. So in the, in, the, in the early 50s, going into the 60s, the vast majority of Jewish giving was going to Jewish causes. Today, the vast majority of serious Jewish giving goes to non-Jewish causes. And that's a trend that will continue as the generations go forward. The generational transfer from my father's generation to my generation and from my generation to my kids' generation is not strong. And that's a big, great concern for any diaspora community going forward. That aging profile, you know, there's 75%, there's twice as many 75-year-olds plus in the Jewish community as in the, the, the non-Jewish community in the UK. And then this impact of, of uh, boycotts and, uh, and the, the assault on Israel's legitimacy is having a fundamental effect on Jewish identity because Israel sits at the epicenter of the Jewish identity of most diaspora Jews and certainly in the Kingdom. And as that assault picks up, and it is picking up, so Jews are becoming very concerned, and students become concerned. So into this arena of a organized community, but a little bit dysfunctional, um, comes, and with these mosaic challenges, comes to South Africa. Um, how I got into it is not quite clear, but I was prevailed upon uh, to become involved in Jewish leadership. And I had one strategic imperative, vitality. I was concerned about ensuring vitality within the community. Because if I could ensure vitality, the community would sustain itself and continue to build itself. It would innovate, it would reproduce its business, uh, it, it would renew its business proposition, and it would grow, and you wouldn't have to do too much to actually keep it going. In the absence of vitality, its strength would be set, and it ultimately would be actually with a red So I was interested in just one thing, vitality and nothing else. But, I, you know, that's a great concept, how do you actually get there? And I sort of, it's so sort of the psyche of the community. You know, when I used to go into new, new countries, I used to think about 
one of the major macro things that I should try and understand about countries in terms of assessing country risk, in terms of that, could understand the risks. You know, some people price their risk. I never priced risk. I determined could I understand the risk and could I mitigate the risk. If I couldn't understand the risk, I wasn't there. I couldn't mitigate. I didn't go there. I never attempted to price risk when I went into a new geography. I tend to try and understand it. Now, there's many metrics you can think about, but I looked at the things on the quadrants of what is the confidence of the people and what are the expectations of the people. Now, there's people who have great expectations and have low and low and have low confidence within their within the environment. That sort of for me is sort of a recipe for disaster, sort of an explosive environment where any society to find itself in. People who have low expectations but have huge confidence in the capacity of the society to deliver. You know, that's an aspirational society. That's ideally where I want to be. And of course you have you know, those people who have high expectations, a lot of confidence in society can deliver. Well, that's potentially an unmanageable situation, but a good place to be nevertheless. And those where there are poor expectations, low confidence, well, that's corrosive. And many countries in Africa you know, tick, that, tick that box. I try to think of the Jewish community in those, in those ways as well. And, and the level of expectations in our community have changed, the level of confidence in our community has changed. So if I think about confidence in the context of the community, I think about how Jews think about the environment, how they think about safety, how they think about Israel is treated, um, how they think about access to the, the main parts of society, um, how they think about economic growth and their level of participation in that economic growth, how they think about the capacity of their leadership to, to deliver and understand what needs to be delivered, how they think about the access that their leadership has, um, how they think about philanthropy. And in terms of expectations, I think about uh, uh, you know, the, effect of the expectations around how will we provide, will the youth be provided for? Um, will there be the ability to um, live out their religious life? Will Kashrut or Brit Mila come under threat? Um, leadership um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of getting the message across. Um, the, the appropriateness of the spiritual traditions which they think they, they need. And, uh, and if I looked at the United, United Kingdom community, I sensed the community when I first came in, which was relatively high in confidence and very high in expectation. And today, I sense a community which is still high in expectation, much lower in confidence. Notwithstanding the level of innovation that, that must have been there uh, for all those organizations to be established. So to get back to the vitality, so to be a vital community, you need to have a lot of momentum, there are a lot of things happening in the community, a lot of things going for you. People need to be empowered. So you have to have a, a, a leadership which effectively is a servant leadership as opposed to a leadership coming from the top down. And so empowerment is, is fundamental. Innovation is important. Um, and you know, just on, on a very simplistic sense, the, uh, the, the marshalling of social media is a critical part in vitality of a community today. The capacity to take risks and to try different things and to test different propositions. Operating in a big tent, in other words, to allow people of very significant diverging views on religion, on culture, on politics, to feel part of the same tent that they can operate within that environment and not fear each other and be tolerant of each other. Resilient to the challenges and a coherent funding proposition. That's what I think the elements of vitality. And, and I'll come back to as to where I think where the scorecard is today. And my philosophy when I entered into this chairmanship of, of the, uh, the JLC was to operate within the universe of the possible. In other words, and that comes right, it gives rise to part of the issue of my incrementalism versus radicalism. To be consistent. In other words, to be constantly plugged the same things. So even if people didn't like what I was saying or didn't like what I was doing, they knew I was going to do them for one from, from one month to the next, one year to the next. They, they understood my direction of travel. Um, to measure my successes in ones and twos, and not in thousands. In other words, I didn't expect to make great changes. I expected to be successful in endeavors. So I, so I was very careful to, 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 to choose a few things to handle at a point in time. To try and get the community to act on facts rather than assumptions. In other words, to be a research-based community. It's only now that we actually are getting, we, we are getting there. And to be seen and, 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 and to be seen in the leadership position, to be visible in the community, in other words, they had to see me. They had to see me at critical times in the community. That I had to be visible in philanthropy, I had to take a, a, a strong position of personal philanthropy, and I had to be visible in adversity. And when things went wrong, they had to see me. Now, 
let me tell you, I haven't always been successful in this, but that's what I've aspired to do. And the arrangements that are critical for success in doing this is coherence in an incoherent uh, communal architecture. So that communal architecture is basically a test be unprepared to deliver real value and real results. But it's a communal architecture which I have to live with. So I have to try and build a coherence out of that. In other words, try and map out a capacity for organizations to operate together and to work out what different organizations are going to do and different donors are going to do and try and get them to coalesce around core common goals. I had to create institutional political access. So access to politicians in our country was always based on individuals. Um, individuals knew particular politicians, they had relationships with prime ministers, they raised money for their parties, and I wasn't happy with that. We had to have institutional access. So I managed to implement, for instance, an annual meeting between the Jewish community and the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Once a year in January, the Prime Minister sits down for two hours and meets with the Jewish community. And he knows that every year in his diary, that's what he's going to do. So that's an important element of access. You know, be a community, I said, of 300,000 people in a, in a population of 60 million, it's not, not a bad thing. We institutionalized access to different parts of the government, which is important for us. Social welfare, education, foreign affairs, security. So we have institutionalized access there. We have rights of access, and we meet often, and they respond to that. The second issue of, uh, of or, or the third, third issue is the question of common agreement on risks and opportunities. So I try to, try to get, in a very narrow way, people to coalesce around a couple of things we could all agree on and, and spend time on that. And then the question of the transition of leadership to move from one generation to the next. When I came to leadership, it was led by people who had led the community from 1967. They were young Turks in 1967 who came out and threw out the old guard, and today they have stayed in place and they are the old guard, except for me. And, uh, and, that was, uh, and that was quite an eye-opener, and it's something which, which I was concerned about and had to change over time. So I took over the UJ and just a little bit segue into this. And the UJ, the United Jewish Israeli Appeal, Basically, it was a potpourri of, of, of different things. It did leadership development in the community. It did formal education. In other words, it trained teachers. It supported schools. It did informal education, supported youth movements and, and their activities. And it sort of directed the British Jewish community's collective philanthropy into Israel. But it was, the support was described at the time. It was basically you couldn't tell the story. So I, tried, I changed the proposition. I'm just doing this as a little bit of a case study. I've made Israel as the epicenter. Uh, of, uh, given that Israel is at the epicenter of Jewish identity, I made Israel at the epicenter of Jewish identity being the cause of the UJA. People could understand that. They could relate to that. They understood that. So I believe the role of the UJA, therefore, is to grow the Zionist experience of young people. I was shattered to find when I arrived in the United Kingdom that Jewish schools didn't consider themselves to be Zionist entities. You know, in South Africa, where I grew up, Jewish schools were Zionist entities. You know, they collaborated and added on to the youth, to the, to the, to the Zionist youth movements, not the schools in England. So we concentrated on growing the Zionist experience of young people, whether they were at youth movements or not at youth movements. We made sure that the summer tour of 16 years to, to Israel took place every year uninterrupted by 2006 war in Lebanon, by Gaza campaign last year. Come rain or shine, 60% of 16 year olds come on tour to Israel, irrespective of what happened. Um, we strengthened youth movements. I try to build connection to the language. Uh, now I speak Hebrew possibly, but not terribly well. But I speak it because I went to school which taught Hebrew. Um, Jewish schools don't teach Hebrew. I can't understand how we can be one united people around the world if we don't connect with one common language. So I'm actually determined by the time I die that the Asper Jewish community will be more or less fluent in Hebrew. We know we're near there now. But I've got a Hebrew curriculum now being taught at Jewish state schools, which was never taught before. Um, and connection to the land. And the reason why connection to the land is important, because if Israel is at the epicenter of your Jewish identity, you have to believe that Israel is an unfinished product. In other words, this great project of the Jewish people, perhaps the greatest project of the Jewish people, the building of the modern state of Israel, is not yet complete. And we in Diaspora Jewry have our role to continue to play. We play the role. Uh, at the, at the emergence state, we have an important part to play in the role now. So that connection to the land is terribly important. And issues on education and leadership stuff, I took out of the UJ and I put them elsewhere. 
And that created a, a viable Gehirt organization which people started supporting again and could, could, they could sign up to. And I used that platform uh, to encourage public demonstrations of this core identity. So, I, so we developed for the first time in Israel's 60th a parade down the center of London and a, um, a gathering um, at, uh, at Trafalgar Square. We held gatherings at Trafalgar Square at odd times where the Intifada was high and, uh, and when Israel was at, in, in a state of war. The tens of thousands of Jews came out and stood in Trafalgar Square with flags of Israel in their hands and walked down Piccadilly. Um, we, we, I spent time to enhance Jewish education. I initiated and established the Commission on Jewish Education to, 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 to make sure that Jewish schools delivered on both the secular and the and the and the Jewish part. So they were they were giving reasonable secular education, but they sort of weren't giving great Jewish education. Now, in this I mean limited Kurdish, Zionist education, Jewish culture, Jewish history. So it's sort of like it's like a boxer who's, who's basically got a got a good attack but a weak defense. Ultimately he's going to be knocked out. And so I, w I wanted to make sure that the Jewish schools could build up their proposition on Jewish education to try and create this new leadership which I mentioned as well to provide some sort of thought leadership. And I used the UJ as a way of penetrating a community which didn't know me. I knew nobody in the United Kingdom when I arrived in 1998, and by 2006 I knew, I didn't know many, many more. But the UJ allowed me to, um, to penetrate that community and to encourage the community to make strategically impactful investments in the United Kingdom. And I just want to segue again into strategically impactful investments. Because up until now, the UJ, like most of the ASPA body which raised money for Israel, do it on the basis of needing some philanthropy. People are starving, soldiers have had their limbs blown off, you've got to support them. Now that actually is not going to raise money continuously. That has a very short life cycle. Because people become insensitive over time. So you go to, after a war, after a bombing, you go and say, we've got to raise people, we've got to raise money for these poor people who have been very badly injured, people write our checks because they have fuel and they're upset, and they want to connect. You go the next year, you give them the same proposition, they'll give a little less. You go the third year, they won't give you at all. Because they've become insensitive. That is, in fact, the strength of the human condition, that we adapt. And so what was horrific before becomes a norm uh, in, uh, in, 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 in years' time. So I did away with believing some philanthropy. I basically said we, we had to basically focus on strategic investments. So the lack of clarity and the lack of focus of the UJ had to be turned around. And the return was measured in the impact we were going to have rather than, rather than how to spend. And, uh, and so from the, from the UJ point of view, we basically looked at identifying a region of risk in Israel, which we chose the Galil, and we chose the Galil for very simple reasons that it's a declining Jewish population. Uh, we looked at people making investments and not even charity. Uh, we did it on the basis of research and data so we could present um, very clear-cut business cases to people um, that it was strategic and not tactical and that it was partnership-based, in other words, with gear returns. And so this region uh, in the Galil basically, as I said, you can't defend, you know, basically can't defend your borders if your people aren't living there. And the, with the declining Jewish population, Israel is at risk. That was a simple proposition that I put to the UK Jewish community. It lacks infrastructure and skills. So people aren't going to live there unless you improve the infrastructure and skills. Where can we play? We can't build roads, and we can't build rail lines, but we can get ourselves involved in education, we can get ourselves involved in healthcare, and we can try and find uh, work, work uh, solutions and develop arrangements where infrastructure solutions can be developed. And also we have available partners. We have foundations, we have the Russian Foundation from France, we have the very foundation from the United States, we have various North American federations, and we also could tap into local and central government if we apply the right way. So the ability to gear up our impact, our investment was significant. And it spoke to my constituents. So basically, in, that, in the period of time that I was at UJA, we essentially were involved in a number of tertiary uh, colleges and, uh, and, and the Sfat Medical School. Uh, we built a number of schools right across from the west to the east of the, of the Galil. We improved schools. We spent about 145 million um, in, uh, on projects, of which ours was 50 million. So we've got a lot of partners to support us in that, and we ran a number of at-risk programs. Now, this is not an evaluation of how effective we are. Nadia Shevel, who 
who heads up UJ in Israel, is more than, more than able to give you the results which demonstrate the effectiveness of this, of this effort. But this was a very important part of keeping our community vested in Israel. You know, just simply asking them to, to come out in times of crisis wasn't, wasn't good enough. So they had a long-term strategic stay in the ongoing business of developing Israel. And then onto the JLC. So I became chairman of the JLC in 2009. It had really existed for five years. It had 12 member organizations and a whole bunch of individual people, the great and the good, or as the majority of you said, the rich man's club. Uh, it was controversial, it was long on leadership, but it was short on representation, in other words, it didn't have a mandate. And it had strategic interventions, but it had simply no strategy. And so that was the organization that I marched into, and I sort of decided, right, up front, this is not effective, we've got to do something different. So I started off by questioning, addressing the issue of legitimacy. I increased the number of member organizations over time. We now have 30 organizations, which represents the bulk of the Jewish, organized Jewish community. Uh, in terms of size and impact. I ended individual members, so I threw individual members off the JLC, and I made sure that we elected a board of trustees from the members. In other words, the trustees were elected people that stood for election and we have competitions, competition for those elections. I tried to build allies across the community. In other words, I, I, I connected with people who were not necessarily the most important, but were influential within their strata of society, the Jewish community try and bring them on board, to make them my friends. And if they were my friends, they would think twice before they criticized me, and they would think twice before they denigrated anything I was doing. They might not come out and support, but they might not be critical. And I had to end the criticism of the JLC. And having allies is the most important way of doing it. Connecting with people, <coughs> making them your friends, makes it very difficult for them to do things uh, to, your, to, to your detriment. I created it as a natural portal to government. So, when the Prime Minister meets with the Jewish community, you will hear him say, I'm meeting with the JLC. That's what he says. And that was important for me, because it built up a status and therefore built up um, a, a business to, a, a, a capacity to reflect back authority back into the community. I tried to develop what I thought was a coherent but very limited strategy, and I looked for victories. And the JLC today is basically, as was said in the introduction, the umbrella body for, for the Jewish community. It's made up of the chairs and presidents of the major communal institutions, and it seeks to address the strategic challenges of the community. And behind that is a mission statement which basically says, we there to look at five things. Safety, vibrancy, its place within British society, proud of Jewish identity, confidence and support of Israel. That's what we want to deliver. That's what we make sure our community has all the time. And we look at a range of services to do that. We look at healthcare, we look at security, we look at education, we look at political education, we look at social responsibility. And that's where we concentrate our efforts on. And the sort of objectives of, 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 the, of the JLC basically are protecting the interests of the Jewish community Jews today in the UK, which is this level of coordination, facilitating appropriate response to BDS, delegitimization, making sure we have the right political responses. And then we have issues for the future, vibrancy for the future. What do we need to do going forward? And I'll come on to that in a in, in, so my first victory was the number of members that I had. So every type of organization represent every facet of life sits in my in the, in the jail C9. Not all the bodies, but these are the major bodies. These spend 90% of the money they spent in the United Kingdom. Secondly, on education, we had the commission. We established the partnership for Jewish schools. We have more effective teachers. We have more effective schools. We have better coherency on the schools. We, have a, we had a commission on youth provision. Uh, we've, implemented, we've got, a, we've got a, um, a hub called Reshet, it's a Jewish youth network. It basically coordinates all the activities of all the informal youth providers within the UK. We established a, a community chest to seed fund, essentially, communal projects in aid of, uh, of, of implementing youth. Priding and understanding, we have every Hanukkah in Trafalgar Square, uh, the Mayor of London, other politicians coming to speak to gatherings of around about 7,000 Jews on average come in and attend Hanukkah in the Square. And the biggest Hanukkah you'll find probably outside the United States, because everything is bigger in the United States. <laughs> Rally, solidarity rallies, um, Jewish learning, you know, there's a whole range of stuff, as I said, that carries on. Access I've already spoken about. The delegitimization, thing, unfinished work, but we have made some progress. 
And social care and vitality, as I said to you, I finally got the social care bodies to agree to this commission. The first meeting is in a couple of days' time under outside facilitation. So when it comes to vitality, I sort of think we have momentum. We sort of sort of empower, we're not quite there because you know, the, the power the empowerment is is focused, but there is a lot of there is enough people in, in the community who lack confidence not to feel empowered. And that concerns me. It is a community which is highly innovative, and that's one of the reasons why we have so many organizations. They they they, they blemish the impact of, of, of the innovation by then going back to traditional structures to deliver on the innovation. I wish I could persuade them that to be innovative, you don't need to be traditional. You don't need communal infrastructure. You, know, you need activists. You can draw on the communal infrastructure to provide funding and, 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 and support, but you don't need to create new infrastructure. Therefore, risk-taking is actually uh, neutral. They don't take risks in, in, in the community. I don't think that we have a big tent. I think we're sort of not quite there. I think there's too much and to me some fighting between the left and the right for there to be a big ten. Too many people want to exclude others from the Jewish debate and the Jewish conversation for there to be a big ten yet in the UK. We're not resilient to challenges. So yes, Gaza was bad, people marching down the street saying Hitler was right was bad. But sending the community to the tailspin in the way that it did suggests to me there's a lack of resilience. There's still an undercurrent of real concern about the legitimacy of citizens in a great democracy. Um, and we don't have a coherent funding proposition. Um, coming from the, the issues that I spoke about, the direction of Jewish philanthropy. So, what are the issues today that I'm dealing with? I basically have four issues that I'm looking at. Israel and uh, legitimization, delegitimization, boycotts um, and sanctions. And, uh, and basically, is it manageable? I think it's maybe. I don't know if it's manageable. I don't know if it's manageable. If it was just simply a response by organized diaspora jury, if that's all it needs, that's what you need, better, you know, better organize yourself, it would be fine. Unfortunately, BDS comes on the basis of the story that people tell about Israel. And the story doesn't play well. And we don't need to debate today whether that's right or that's wrong, but that's the reality. And until the story changes, I'm not sure that we will actually be able to manage the question of Israel's legitimacy in the community of nations. And I think this is a very, very serious concern. It's serious for Israel. But my concern is how serious it is for the diaspora community. Because it undermined Israel. Israel, which is not seen to be part of the community of nations, which is not seen to be a legitimate player in a world which people want to associate with, undermines people's Jewish identity in a fundamental way. And my kids, when they go to university, I don't want them to have second thoughts about whether they stand up for Israel, whether they're proud that they're Jewish, whether they're anti into the debate. I don't want them to stand for that. And I'm not sure that we would be again able to fight that effectively. Social care for the next 20 years, probably, and I'll deal with that now. Financial viability, probably as well. The demographic revolution, I don't know. So let's look at all these, these imperatives. On the question of delegitimization, what can I do? I've got a structural response. We are building a new policy hub, which will basically allow, again, people involved in the whole plethora of Israel dynamics and delegitimization to join together to have coordinated, effective responses and build up proactive, um, proactive programs, both in British civil society to build activists and people who identify with the community, identify with Israel and British civil society, and within the community. Basically, what I want to do is get a situation where the level of activism taking place across the UK has this positive result, that the non-Jewish person in the United Kingdom, when, when difficulties arise here in this region, and in Israel in particular, will basically say, I might not like what is happening, I might not like the response, but you know what, I understand the existential complexity of Israel's position, and I'll give them a pass. Today, that doesn't happen. The minute, and, and there's, a, there's a wonderful photograph I produced when I was talking to some people in the business community about BDS, where I showed juxtaposition next to each other the death of a Jewish child and a Palestinian child in the last Gaza campaign. Now, the Jewish child was a soldier and the Palestinian child was a baby. But their mothers, both mothers, were equally distraught. And I said to them, which picture do you think plays more powerfully in the United Kingdom? And the answer is obvious. And so the minute the media gets going, you lose the society that you live in. And we can't
can't afford to do that. We know that they return. We know that they fundamentally actually are not anti-Semitic and fundamentally not at Israel. In fact, most of them don't actually care a damn about Israel. But we can't afford to lose them in the time of crisis. Because at some point in time, when you lose society at the time of crisis, your politicians have a license to do stupid things. And right now we have a very solid prime minister who's very solid in Israel. Now, God forbid Jeremy Corbyn becomes prime minister and we lose society, what response will he have? So it's very important that politicians are led by society. Media is actually led by society. We have to find a way of connecting with them. And so that hub is basically going to have the, that, those elements to it. And, and one of the ways we're thinking about it is to run a series of campaigns which people can understand. So the one campaign is from 2015 onwards is the contribution that Jews have on an ongoing basis to British society, not the great and the good, all the people. Cable Street. Now, Cable Street uh, took place some 80 years ago where the left wing, the trade unionists, and the Jewish community banded together to physically fight in the streets of London the fascists. And when the police came out to protect the fascists. So that was one of the great instances where the community, the Jewish community, had common cause with a section of the British population which ordinarily would have no interest in, in, in connecting with Jews. And today, the left wing have no interest in connecting with Jews. The left wing are generally borderline anti-Semitic. The trade unions are borderline anti-Semitic. We have something here which can bring us back to that level of connection. So running that table to speak campaign in 2016 is fundamentally important. The Belfort Declaration 2017. Wow. You know, the cradle or the, 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 uh, the genesis of the modern Jewish state came out of that declaration. It's a very short letter that was written to Baron Rathbun of Rothschild saying basically we've decided that the Jews should have a homeland uh, but we have to make sure that we protect the rights of, uh, of uh, non-Jewish non -Jewish, uh, people living in, 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 uh, in, in Palestine at the time. There's high potential for that a uh, hundred year anniversary to be turned on its head and where the government becomes defensive and has to be upon and has to apologize for the impacts or the displacements that, that happened as a result of the Gulf Declaration. We have to make sure that it's a celebration. We have to make sure that we connect with the with the British people that they see that as something that, that is one of the most outstanding pieces of statesmanship from a British politician and one of the most outstanding gifts that one society gave to another. That's an important campaign. If we can win that campaign, we've got a long way to actually connect Jews and, 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 and civils with civil society. And of course, Israel's 70th comes in 2018, which is sort of more going to be for the Jewish community, less for the, uh, for, for, for the, the secular community, but nevertheless have some resonance. And in short, it's social care. I demonstrated to the aging population the, the expanding needs. Islands of impoverishment come from aging populations as well. So we have this response that Commissioner I've told you about meeting in a couple of days' time. Hopefully it will answer those questions and we'll get, we'll get moving on that. By the time I step down, I will feel that there's some momentum to that. The issue of capacity to fund. So fewer people are giving, as I said to you. It's fragmented because 3,000 organizations. There's a tyranny on the donors. Everybody's asking the donors for money from all over the world. There's limited generational transfer of philanthropic giving. So, my father gave money which he couldn't afford to give because he considered his obligations and the tax on the Jewish people and he had to do it. Okay? I give because I think that can make a difference. Right? My, my children basically think about giving differently. They think about, well, where do I want to make a difference? Is there another place where I can make more of a difference? What return am I going to get? Are making that difference. And they basically are looking at a whole bunch of competing issues. I was speaking to the son of one of this university's uh, large donors um, in the United Kingdom. So at the moment, the Family Trust, which is substantial, gives 90% of the stuff to Jewish causes. He wants to reduce to 50%. So that's telling you what generational transfer is all about. And in fact, the lack of generational transfer is all about. Now, this philanthropic crisis comes at the same time the government is reducing its funding because not only do the government fund faith schools, they fund much of our social services. 75% of our social services is paid by the British taxpayer. But that funding is coming down as well. 
So essentially, we are having a decreasing amount of money available to the community with expanding needs. I don't know the answer. I don't know how I'm going to resolve that question. Maybe some type of federated campaign has to be introduced, but that's difficult. Um, but I have to make, I have to try and encourage the large foundations and the large donors to join together to set priorities. One of the smallest diaspora Jewish communities in the world is the Cape Town Jewish community. It's got sort of 17,000 Jews in it. It is the best organized community in the world. It has something called the Priorities Board. No charity can raise money unless the Priority Board signs off on their budget. So each individual charity does its own thing, does its own fundraising, but no charity can raise money and no person will give money until the Priorities Board has given its temple and said, that's good to go. I'd love to get that in the United Kingdom. I'll never quite get there, but if I can get approximate there, I can solve some of the problems that we have uh, and achieve economies of scale that are critical in reducing the funding need to where the funding expectations are going. The question of the demographic revolution. The question of vitality. So the mainstream community is clearly declining. It's declining by 0.3% per annum. The Karate community is growing at 5% per annum. Karate fraternity rate is 7 whereas it's 1.98 for the mainstream. So basically, what am I telling you? I'm telling you that's the profile of the Korean community in 2011. That is a very concerning picture for a whole range of reasons. And I don't say this in any way because I'm against people uh, being um, uh, extremely, uh, their, their religious federations being on the extreme end of the scale. But this is a community that is generally separate from the mainstream community. They live in, in separate geographies. They generally do not mix. Um, I, I was telling some friends the other day that uh, a good friend of mine was, was, was ill a few years ago. He subsequently passed away. And I met, and he was a counselor. He was a rabbi, but he's also a counselor. And he's one of these few people who could easily move between the Haredi and, and, and modern Orthodox world. So he was a counselor both in the Haredi community and the modern Orthodox community. And one of the people that he gave effect to counseling to was a Haredi family, and the, the father of the family used to visit him. And I met the father as a result of these things. We never had much to say to each other, but we knew each other. He, the family hit on hard times. His son became very ill. And he wrote me a letter. Uh, he emailed me. And, and, uh, it took me quite a while to decipher the email because although he had been brought and brought up, uh, born and bred in England, his English wasn't that great. But basically, he told me that he had a real financial crisis and he gave me this, this sad story about his son. And he said, I went to my rabbi and I asked him, was it permissible to raise money from the other side? So you've got to understand how the Haredi community view a guy like me. And I think, I'm, myself, I'm not on the other side. I'm, a, I'm Jew straight down the line. But I'm on the other side. So this is a very separate community. Why am I concerned about it? What concerns me about it? Basically, the child dependency ratio in this community stands at 137. Again, it's a crude ratio. It's basically people from 0 to 19 expresses a percentage of people from 20 to 64. In other words, the dependence over the, uh, the people who provide for the dependencies. That 137 is a higher ratio, as you can see, than Africa and the Middle East. It's a ratio generally which associates with social disintegration. It is not a ratio now. I know we can say, well, it, there are different things within the Karate community which militate against it, and that's true. The cohesiveness of the family, uh, the respect for authority and all that stuff is very important in media ratio. But nevertheless, I, we are seeing signs of social disintegration starting now within the community in the UK. If I look at the, the question of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of, of, of adults of 15 to 24 as a percentage of the total adult population, I come up with a factor of 30%. Now I'm told again by, by people involved in this that at a rate of 30, that again is an indicator of, of real concern, but basically there are too many people looking for too few jobs. Or well, potentially you have people in that area who are not looking for jobs, but they're looking for they're looking for a basis of, 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 of earning income which is run around. If you look by 2031, 50% of kids between North and four will be from the Haredi community. Basically I'm telling you the Jewish community in the United Kingdom is in for a radical change, a radical, radical shift. And that radical shift is going to bring with it massive problems. And certainly won't bring with it a vital community. And I'm very concerned about that. And I don't even think that actually it's going to give rise to a vital Haredi community in a spiritual sense. I think it's going to undermine the potential of the spiritual unity of the Haredi community. And I don't know what my response to that should be. I, I really haven't worked it out. 
I need to find a way in which we can engage with these young people in a way which gives them some sort of life normality, whether it's sport and recreation or something, to create a facility where they can connect with their fellow community and they can engage in a set of activities which doesn't undermine at all the religious ethos of the community, which doesn't give rise to a fear that we're breaking down barriers uh, and therefore we're going to impact their idea of Torah sovereignty. But we have to find a way we can connect with these young people. We cannot afford for them to grow up in an isolated way. Um, it might well be that I have to challenge the education proposition of their schools. In other words, to find a way we can work with them or work with government to force them into an education system which gives their kids more rounded education. So this, the, 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 the financing side, the funding side, and, and this vitality issue on the Korean community, I don't have answers for right now. I just have big problems. To conclude, so one of the lessons that I've learned, I realize that you're never in charge and you're never thanked as a communal leader. <laughs> um, if you read much of the press about me, you'll, you'll see that that's, uh, I, I get that in spades. That you always mess up, but you should hopefully have a few more successes than you have as failures. That you have to maintain a level of consistency and momentum. I mean, many people don't like what I do you know, in, in, in the community, but all of them know what I'm doing. Uh, and they respect me at least uh, for that. Um, the strategic, your strategy and action should be based on research and not based on, on assumption. Uh, you've got to continuously communicate. I haven't been as good as that as I should be, but I have been consistent. And you have to accept that a sign of success in the community is the community constantly challenges what you do. And in my early days when I was younger and immature, I rebelled against the challenge, but today I sort of accept it and ride with it. And you have to believe at the end of the day otherwise you don't do this job, that the a vital community will ultimately prosper. So it's not, the, the question is building vitality, it's not the question of what, whether, whether, it's, whether it's helped or not. And opportunities to contribute always exist. And that's why, you know, much to the chagrin of my family, I'm constantly engaged with the UK Jewish community. Now I spoke for a hell of a long time, I do apologize, but I have fun today. Three or four mental questions. Yes, sir. Um, can you give a little bit more? I didn't, I didn't see statistics or numbers about involvement in the Jewish community. In other words, you have a number of, a lot of organizations, but to what extent are the 270,000 people involved, committed, uh, asking the questions why, both regarding involvement and philanthropy? So that is not an easy question to, to answer. We have just we have completed recently completed so we have a research organisation, the Jewish Policy Research, which has completed um, a study which, which I'm still waiting to get the numbers out of. But I think you, you should assume that there's a core 40 to 40 to 50 percent which are generally involved in cost cost of board mainstream stuff. We've got about 20 percent of the community which I would call the secular Jewish community, which gets involved in things like JW3 which essentially is a, is a sort of an organization which is there within the common infrastructure, but it's always been seen not sort of to be part, uh, to be part of the norm. And you've got about, I would say, 25 to 30% who are not engaged at all. And it's from those people, ultimately, those families just slip away. So they might be Jewish today, they're not going to be Jewish tomorrow. But I, I don't have a better answer for you on that. And, and, and I would say that, interestingly enough, that you have a much more stable proposition on people who fund the community. So people who fund the community tend to tend to fund it across the board. So you get people people who fund um, <coughs> Zionist youth movements will fund um, Chabad um, and will fund Jewish care and will fund things like that. So the funding base, which is narrow, which is relatively small, tends to fund across the board. Um, I think it's fair to say that there's a, there's a shift in younger generations in the Haredi community in Israel in terms of their attitude to the state. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of thinking talking about that. Do you think there's something similar going on in terms of the relationship of the younger generation of the Haredi community in England in terms of their attitude to the state and therefore connection with Israel becomes to, to, to the state of Israel? Israel. Yeah. Not, not to the state of Israel. Not to the state of Britain, no, to the state of Israel. Which would then mean that Israel becomes a meaningful point of connection yeah. for their integration. I'm going to give you uh, an emphatic answer for that. No, absolutely not. Okay. 
I'm just going to call it. It's a chairman that uh, we're very close to four o'clock, and um, some lecturers have to lecture elsewhere. The students have to run to lectures. Um, I cannot tell you how inspired I am and thankful to Nick for demonstrating what social entrepreneurship is all about. Those are my students who are with, you, with us and hear me talk about social entrepreneurship. I talk about social entrepreneurship. Nick doesn't. And there's a tremendous difference. Here is an individual who speaks with the same accent that I speak. Lands in a country which is highly suspicious of foreigners. I'll say it again. Highly suspicious of foreigners. Within eight years, moves into a leadership position of number one in the community. And not only moves into the leadership community of position, but basically puts the community on a course which hopefully will make it prosper for many generations. If you look through the bio of Mick, I saw two words which I think ran through the whole bio but in different dimensions. Energy and investment. Mick is responsible personally for a lot of the energy which is driving this world. <clears throat> Mick is responsible as well for the investment in many of those areas of economic activity which are going to be prosperity to the world. Mick is also responsible for the energy which is now taking place in the British Jewish community. And Mick is responsible for the future investment in the prosperity of the Jewish community. I've never ever seen a bio of a business executive which commences a course of economic activity that ends a study in a Jewish day school. Many people talk about the alma mater in terms of graduate studies. At the foot of Mick's bio, I studied at Theodor Herzl, the Jewish day school in Port Elizabeth, which for me has a very, very strong personal history. It was founded by my father in law, Shlomo Levy. Mick studied, and Mick studied with him. And I think that says it all. And Mick didn't come there by himself, he came with Barbara. And Barbara is a teacher in the Jewish day school. So whatever Mick is basically saying over here, up in the clouds, ultimately is rooted in some very serious Jewish education. Mick, I want to thank you for a presentation, which I'm spellbound because you do this in the night. And that's what you do in the day. In other words, <laughs> you're in a real business in the day. Mick is driving this in the night. And I know that he's a wonderful father and a wonderful husband, etc. If only more people will take our future into their hands, that is exactly what social entrepreneurship is about. We are responsible. And we're not responsible because we were elected to be responsible. We're not responsible because we were appointed by him to be responsible. We're responsible because we feel that we want to make this a better world. Mick, may you be successful. And hopefully you will inspire this, not only in terms of the talks that you give, the addresses that you give, but the work that you do, to inspire many others to follow your tracks. between vitality and intelligence. And that's what we both saw and heard here. It's the most considered account of a Jewish community that I've heard from a lady. 